Good morning my fellow explorers and treasure hunters. Today I want to talk about, continue our discussion on the Grand Canyon, the Aztec, the Asian influence uh, that we talked about at the Kincaid story. I want to expand that and talk about some of the Chinese history, the Tibetan history of some of the peoples that show up in the DNA record over here in America and propose some theories on how they arrived here. I also want to talk about the possibility that the most prized artifact, the most valuable artifact in the entire world, the entire history of the, of the world, may be sitting in a cave in the Grand Canyon. The uh, heirloom seal of the realm that disappeared in the nine, 900s, uh, 900 uh, AD in China during the time that the, the northern dynasty of that region was in power. The very same dynasty that was in power came from the Buddhist monk that came to America year, many years prior. He was from that same region in China. The people in that region had a knowledge of America and of what was over here. And when the Ming dynasty attacked, that heirloom seal of the realm disappeared. Did it come to America? Did it end up in the Grand Canyon in one of the underground cities or caves? We're going to discuss that today. Uh, I want to, I'm going to read my manuscript here so I don't miss anything. Once again, I have a lot of information. I'm going to show photographs and back up my, my, uh, documentation here with evidence and I'm gonna put in some quotes from other people that, that also backs up the history of what I'm talking about. Okay in my last video I talked about the possibility of the GE Kincaid cave in the Grand Canyon. Uh, in this video I want to show the evidences but the connection between the Aztec and the Asian people. I want to also show evidence of uh, the Manchu, Manchu script, which is based on the uh, Mongolian alphabet. This ancient people that lived in northern China, these influences can be found in many of the petroglyphs, in many of the writings in the petroglyphs in this area around the Grand Canyon. So this is one of my theories, is that we can find the influence of these people that came from northern China and in the petroglyph panels because I've seen many many figures and scripts on these panels that to me look like they're ancient Chinese or one of those similar uh, languages. I'm going to show some pictures of those. Okay. Hen Shi, a native Buddhist missionary, sailed east from China to a far-off land they called Fusang. From, four, from 458 A.D. until 499 A.D., uh, Hu Shen, um, a native Buddhist missionary from the northern region of China, sailed to a far land they called Fusang. When he returned, he re when he returned 41 years later, he reported to the, the Chinese emperor at the time, and he told about the gold, the silver, the um, copper, and the different types of vegetation that he witnessed there, as well as the amazing land and about the people. He talks about the red mulberry tree that they used. He also talked about the agave plant. He describes a plant that resembles the agave plant that's very widely used in Mexico, New Mexico, in the Texas region by the natives at that time. Um, they, he said that they used the plant for food, for drink, and to make clothing out of. And the natives at that time did indeed use that plant to um, for all those things and more. 
And if you stay to the end of the video, I have a special announcement about a unique gathering taking place in Utah later this year in August. Um, it's for researchers, treasure hunters, Bigfoot enthusiasts, UFO researchers, and all the good stuff that everybody wants to know about and learn about. They're going to have a gathering, and uh, they had this last year, and it was a big hit, and it's going to be even bigger and uh, a lot more fun this year. They've, they've improved some of their, their things, and at the end of this video, I'm going to explain the details about that. Okay, so without further ado, let's get to the chase. DNA studies done prior to 2016 by geneticist Oleg Bolinowski have conclusive conclusively shown that the Aztec, Inca, and Iroquois are closely related to the Altai people of the region that borders China and Mongolia. So the Aztec, the, the Inca, the Iroquois are closely related to the people in China, northern China and Mongolia. The Altai people, it's spelled A-L-T-A-I. One theory has them crossing the Bering Strait and working their way down the western coast to Mexico. While this may be the route for the people that inherit, that live in the native people of Alaska and Canada, it's a hard stretch of the imagination that these natives would give up their way of life so closely connected to the sea and to the tundra, the wildlife that they hunted, the fish of the sea that they fished for, the walruses, the reindeer, everything that was part of their culture. It's a hard stretch of the imagination that they would come all the way down the western coast to the semi-arid high desert of Utah and Arizona, today Utah and Arizona, Grand Canyon, and then down into Mexico for even further south. A more simple explanation comes from the Chinese history. The Chinese, are, their histories is one of the oldest continuous written record of the civilization that we have. And in their history they tell about several trips made to a region they called Fusang. The earliest trip was made by a Chinese magician or a sorcerer by the name of, of Zhu Fu. Zhu Fu uh, came to Fu Sang in uh, 200, around 200 BC. And according to the Chinese history, he was sent by the emperor, or by the leader at the time, to make a sacrifice of 3,000 prisoners, 3,000 uh, convicts, to a volcano god. Um, so that he could get the elixir, the, the elixir of life. And basically he was looking for the Holy Grail, uh, the Chinese Holy Grail. And he wouldn't have been going to make a sacrifice to the volcano god if the Chinese didn't know there was a volcano going off in Fusang at the same time. So a more simple explanation comes from Chinese history which tells of a series of explorations and trips by ship to a land called Fusang. Buddhist monks came to, the, to this region of Fusang to convert whatever people they found to Buddhism. There was a trip by a Buddhist, Buddhist monk called Hu Shem from 458 A.D. to 499 A.D. So for 41 years he was gone on this expedition to this land called Fusang, which was supposed to be 20,000 Chinese miles to the east. And so if you compare Chinese miles to what we're used to as miles, that would put them squarely on the coast of Mexico. Um, on his return, he reported his experiences and findings to the Chinese emperor. He told of a land rich in copper, gold, and silver, but where the people did not work or have iron. 
He talks of the red mulberry tree, the agave plants used for food, drink, and to make clothing. He also talked about many of the huge and impressive land features that he saw in this land. An earlier expedition from China claims that in 219 BC, Emperor, Emperor Shi Hong sent an expedition of 3,000 convicts to a place far off to the east across the ocean to a place called Fusang. They were required to make a sacrifice to a volcano god who held the elixir of life. The expedition disappeared and was never heard from again. It was this history that probably promoted Hu Shen to take his missionary trip to find these people and convert them to Buddhism. Perhaps Zhu Fu, the expedition leader of that earlier trip of the convicts, pioneered the new land and set himself up as the leader or emperor of that people that he took with him and of the natives that they encountered. Because if they were to start a new civilization, they obviously intermarried with the natives. And that brings us to the DNA, DNA um, evidence. Um, the DNA evidence shows that the people of Asia, Northern Asia, and the people of the Aztec, the Inca, and the Iroquois, and the, the Uto-Aztecan people have this Mongolian Chinese DNA intermixed in their population. The time frames that all these things happen correspond to when many things were happening with the Aztec, as well as with natural uh, events, volcanoes, earthquakes, and other things that were happening here in the western United States and in into Mexico. All the, the turmoils that were going on from drought, uh, volcanoes, earthquakes, and different events like that. The contact with the Chinese groups that sailed across here is a much more plausible explanation for the DNA connection than the trip down the west coast from Siberia. At least in my opinion it is a much more plausible explanation. Especially since we have the Chinese records that tell about different groups at different times sailing for the land of Fusang which just happens to be the distance from China eastward to around the coast of Mexico. The plants, the stories, some of the things that they, they told upon when they returned to the Empire seem to match that region quite closely. It's not much of a stretch of the imagination when we look at the preceding evidence that a group of these people or this very people made their way and farmed the region around the Grand Canyon and I'm going to give some evidence of that as well as perhaps uh, created the underground city in the Grand Canyon region maybe as a, as a way to escape from the natural disasters, the volcanic activity the different things that were going on um, anyway let me proceed here with the, these evidences Several things are made more interesting by the irrefutable DNA connection. For one is the story of G. E. Kincaid finding an underground city in the Grand Canyon that would have been used and accessed at a time when the opening or cave could have been accessed by a boat. Certainly around 219 BC, the time of Zhu Fu, a voyage with 3,000 prisoners or the later trip by Hu Shen, the Buddhist monk, from 458 to 499 AD, the waters of the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon could have been dammed up by the volcanic activity. Indeed, the Unicret volcanic flow associated with the creation of Vulcan's throne 
and the damming up of the Colorado River at Lava Falls, geologists tell us that around from 1,000 to 2,000 years ago is when this occurred. This is the perfect time for access to the cliff cave where the Buddhist stone carved statues and artifacts were found by Kincaid. It corresponds perfectly to the time of the Chinese expeditions to Fusang. This would also explain the genetic contact to the Aztec people. It could explain the close proximity between the Aztec treasure and the treasure of the cave of Kincaid. They could be one and the same treasure or one of the seven treasure caves that occur in the history of the Aztecs. This could also explain all the legends or verbal histories of the Paiute, Havasupai, Wallapai, and other Indians living in the area. The Indians of that time recalled a people that once lived in and around the Grand Canyon, raised crops, and eventually left. And when they left, they left these tribes that were stayed in the region as watchers over these caves. Another thing that the arrival of the Fusang in the southwest could explain is many of the mysterious petroglyphs that appeared around this time period in some of the around this time period with some of the native tribes at this time in this area around the Grand Canyon. Many of these petroglyphs seem to show ancient Manchu script characters based on the Mongolian alphabet. So to quickly recount, we have DNA studies that show the Aztec share DNA with the northern Chinese Altai people, the very people that came from, came from China, according to the Chinese record, to the land of Fusang. We have the expedition of Zhu Fu to sacrifice prisoners to a volcano god across the sea to the east. At the very same time that there were volcanoes erupting along the Colorado River in the area. This was also the area that Kincaid later found the cave with Asian relics and Buddhist statues. We have the later expedition of Hu Shen, the Buddhist monk and his, and his group, the group that was with him, to convert the people of Fusang perhaps the people that had gone on before, or any natives they encountered. Hu Shen was gone for 41 years before he went back to report to the Emperor of China. We have treasures from the Aztec and possible Altai Mongolians rumored to be in the Grand Canyon area. The verbal and oral traditions of at least three groups telling of a people who lived in and around the Grand Canyon who left a vast treasure. In 2013, while I was exploring an area around the Grand Canyon in this very region that I'm talking about, I was exploring it on Google Earth, and I discovered an extensive series of ancient canals ancient canals and terraces. These canals and terraces look just like the canals and terraces in China used for growing rice and other crops. These features resemble a huge rice paddy, a huge terraced rice paddy. Obviously the water table was much higher at this time and a year-round stream flowed through the valley and provided water to the terraces and crops that were planted. Of great interest and, a, and one evidence that all these things happened at the same time and were of ancient origin is that when the Unicret volcanic activity, when that volcano continued to erupt, part of the flow flowed down and over these terrace features. 
also found in this flow, so we know that there were people in the region at the time, were shards of pottery that were found in the vault that have been found in that volcanic flow. So that volcanic flow came down and flowed over the edges of that terraced area where they were growing crops. So we know that it, that predated that volcanic activity. Those terraces predated some of that, at least some of that volcanic activity. My research into many of the petroglyph panels in this region has led to discoveries in the similarities to some of the ancient Manchu Mongolian writing styles. Did these Chinese people teach the natives their writing which was adopted to use in some of their petroglyphs? Many southwest tribes were active in the region at this time. The Anasazi, the Fremont, the Paiute, the Zuni, the Hopi, the Havasupai, the O'odham, and the Aztec people were all in this region at the same time. All the Uto Aztecan speaking people were here. Did the knowledge that Hu Shen took back to the Emperor of China about the the grandeur of Fusang lead to later migrations. At the time, the heirloom seal of the realm disappeared from China. I'm going to read to you now about what the heirloom seal of the realm is. We have various petroglyphs in this region that seem to show an object of great importance that looks very similar and much like what the heirloom seal of the realm would have looked like. So we have petroglyph panels that show something of great importance that could be the heirloom seal of the realm in this area. Could actually be shown in some of the petroglyphs. Now I'm going to read this about the heirloom seal because it's something that I've and been investigating recently and I don't want to get the information wrong. The heirloom seal of the realm, known as the Imperial Seal of China, is a Chinese jade seal carved out of Hashibi, a sacred piece of jade. In 221 BC, so in 221 BC, that would have been right about the time of Zhu Fu, that Zhu Fu left for Fu Sheng. The seal was created when the Qin Shi Hong destroyed the remaining Waring states and united China under the Qin dynasty. Hashibi was a famous piece of jade stone which previously belonged to the Zhao state, passing into the hands of the new emperor of China. He ordered it made into his imperial seal. The words, having received the mandate from heaven, may the emperor lead a long and prosperous life, were written by Prime Minister Li Si and carved into the seal by Sun Shao. The seal was carved from jade because in ancient China, jade was symbolic of the inner beauty within humans. Many tombs and burials from ancient China contained decorative jade, including a jade burial suit unearthed in 1968 that belongs to a Han prince, Lu Shen. During the Han dynasty, the Chinese associated jade with immortality. So they associated jade with immortality. Isn't it interesting that Zhu Fu uh, was sent by the emperor of that time to find or to sacrifice 3,000 uh, convicts to a volcano god in order to get the elixir of life. Everybody was looking for the the eternal you know the eternal power of youth to live forever. And jade was associated with with this eternal life. The Chinese associated jade with immortality to a point where some individuals attempted to drink jade in liquid form to gain eternal life. This further complements the idea of the mandate of heaven and why the seal was carved in jade, China's most valued material for thousands of years.
In Romance of the Three Kingdoms says that Liu Bang, who became the first Han Emperor, saw a phoenix, or a firebird, set on a rock and presented the rock to Zhang, Zhang Yu, the king of Chu, who split the stone in two with his sword and found the jade from which the seal was carved. At the death of the second emperor of Qin, his successor, Ziying, proffered the seal to the new emperor, new emperor of the Han dynasty, whether it was known as the Han Heirloom Seal of the Realm. At the end of the Western Han Dynasty in 9 CE, Wang Mang, the usurper, forced the Han Empress Dowager to hand over the seal. The Empress Dowager, in anger, threw the seal on the ground, chipping it in one corner. Later, Wang Mang ordered the corner to be restored with pure gold. This seal was passed on even as dynasties rose and fell. It was seen as legitimizing device, signaling the mandate of heaven. During turbulent periods such as the Three Kingdoms period, the seal became an object of rivalry and armed conflict. Regime, regimes which possessed the seal de declared themselves as legitimate. At the end of the Han Dynasty in the 3rd century AD, General Sun John found the imperial seer, seal when his forces occupied the evacuated Han imperial capital, Liu Yang. In the sequence of the campaign against Dong Zhu, giving it to his chief warlord, Zhang Su. The Romance of the Three Kingdoms says that one of Sun Jin's men betrayed him and told about the seal to the coalition leader, Yao Shao who asked him for the seal, but Sun Jin refused. He swore that if he had the seal, he might die a violent death and set out for his home. Nevertheless, Yao Shao told Liu Bao to block his way. Liu Bao did so and was unable to defeat Sun Jin. This began a, began a rivalry between them. Sun Jin, according to his oath, died a violent death in an ambush while fighting. Lao Bao later on. Sun Jin's son, Sun Si, inherited the seal and gave it to Yao Shao so that he might lead his troops to take revenge for his uncle's death, who had been fighting warlord Liu Kong. Yao Shao then declared himself emperor under the short lived Zong dynasty in 197. This act angered the warlords Cao Cao and Lao Bei leading to several crushing defeats by each army. The seal remained in the hands of the Wei Dynasty emperors until the last emperor, Cao Han, was forced to abdicate in Sima Yan's favor, passing the seal to Cao and Sima and establishing the Jin Dynasty in 265. So as you can see, that this heirloom seal had a very, very bloody and powerful history. All the warlords, all the emperors, all the dynasties that had the power uh, owned this seal. The fate of the seal during and after the five dynasties and ten kingdoms period is not known. There are several theories that exist to when and how it was lost. The one that intrigues me and seems most to fit the possible narrative of the seal ending up in the uh, area of Fusang and perhaps in the caves of the Grand Canyon is this. When the Yao emperors came into power, now the or the Yan emperors came into power, now this, this, this group of emperors were from northern China, from the, from the, from the border of Tibet, China, and they were tied in with closely with the Mongolians and um, the Manchu, the Manchu and Mongolian connection to the northern region of China. So when the same people were in power as the Buddhist monk and that were sent to Fusang many years before, so the same region was in power. They had the same the was the emperor at that time, 
would have known about the, the trips and travels to Fusang. And so there is a very close connection to these, to these same people and same groups of people when they were in power in China. Okay, so the heirloom seal would be the single most valuable artifact ever found or recovered if it were found today. At one point, it was valued at 15 Chinese cities. One of the emperors, one of the various emperors tried to buy it for 15 Chinese cities in return. When we see what ancient Chinese artifacts are valued at today, the official jade seal that authenticates the entire Chinese emperor or empire is valued at over a billion dollars by some experts today. Interestingly, it dis disappeared around the time the Yan emperors were in power, the same people who left China for Fusang in earlier expeditions. When the Ming armies, the Ming armies, which later became the Ming dynasty, when they attacked the Yan dynasty, the northern Yang dynasty, the heirloom seal had disappeared along with some of the ruling class people. Did this famous artifact make its way to Fusang along with these people that were escaping the Ming dynasty? Did they take this artifact to the hidden treasure caves in the Grand Canyon? We know it has never been found by any of the succeeding emperors or dynasties, even though exhaustive searches have been made. Many counterfeit seals were created in China to offset its loss, but none of them took the place of the heirloom seal. Various leaders have found or sold some of the imperial seals from lesser, from individual emper emper emperors, or leaders that were made. And one of the latest ones, the Imperial Seal, the, the, it's called the Imperial Seal of the Emperor, Kung Shi, it sold for $12 million at a Sotheby's auction in Hong Kong. Compared to the Heirloom Seal, which would be priceless, this is a small amount when you compare it to what the value of 15 Chinese cities would be today. At the time the seal disappeared, a little over a thousand years ago, would have been a perfect time to float a boat into the mid-regions of the Grand Canyon and cache a treasure and the heirloom seal in a difficult to reach and find cave carved out by earlier settlers from Fusang from the same northern China region that was in power when the seal disappeared. When it disappeared in front of the invading armies of the Ming. I like to think it's here. I am much more convinced that the, the uh, seal, the imperial seal, the, uh, could be here than the Ark of the Covenant which has been talked about by some other treasure groups and uh, it's been on the History Channel and I think that the the little boxes and things with the ornaments and stuff that are shown in various petroglyphs in the desert southwest to me they much more likely to represent the heirloom seal than they are the Ark of the Covenant. At least we have a a record of a people coming here and we have a record of an artifact disappearing and then we have things that are petroglyphs that are carved or drawn in their likeness of a possible seal here in the desert southwest around the Grand Canyon region. When the later invasion of the Aztec, so when the later invasion of the Aztec by Cortez did the Aztec leader Montezuma, who DNA records show, DNA um, studies show, was closely tied by blood to these Asian people, did he recall this hidden treasure cave or cave system 
and also hide the Aztec treasure from Cortez and the greedy Spanish in this same area. Is this the reason the old Spanish way bill that we received tells of a cave in the region that contained a treasure greater than any known to man? So the, way, the old way bill that we have talks about a treasure hidden in a cave near the Grand Canyon that contains a treasure greater than any known to man. So here we have this artifact that is considered to be the most valuable artifact in human history. Well, I think, I think the Jewish people would contend that the Ark of the Covenant was the most valued artifact. But the Chinese would contend that this heirloom seal of the realm uh, would be the most valued artifact in existence. And so, I like to think that the evidence points that it's very possible that the heirloom seal of the realm and even the Ark of the Covenant could be in the same, same region. What, what, what do you think? What's your opinion of this? Some other interesting things to think about are some of the ritualistic sacrifice things that popped up in the Aztec culture around the same time as all these things were going on. When the Aztec moved from their homeland, homeland when they moved from Watsitland, from Lake Kapala, and, and, and left in humility, and then established their, their new society uh, in Mexico City on Lake Texacoco, did the, the sacrifices, the human sacrifices that they start at that time, was that, a result, was that as a result of, the, of these people from northern China showing up with the, with the uh, religious belief or background or, or that they needed to sacrifice human beings to the fire god? Um, I mean... Where, where did this human sacrifice that the Aztec began practicing, where did it come from? We don't have any record of human sacrifice taking place in the ancient petroglyphs in, in and around the origins of the Aztec. And you would certainly think that something that significant would show up in the, in the archaeological record in the region. Among, in the, and the oral traditions of the Uto-Aztecan people. We don't see that until they show up and are in Mexico. Did the people that come come from did the peoples that came from China bring this religious um, belief or cult or whatever you want to say with them that they needed to sacrifice in order to receive the elixir of life? I don't know, it just seems kind of interesting that all these things kind of come to a crossroads at this time and in this place. What do you think? What's your opinion? Uh, any, any of you that have done some research? Any, any unique things that you have found that I have not mentioned? Um, any different ideas that could connect the dots? I'd be interested in hearing. This research, just as, as I do more and more research, it just gets deeper and more evidences seem to appear. We also have, as I mentioned in the previous video, we have the crop species, some of which the Chinese made note of in their records when they returned to the emperor. And, one, and, and at least two of these plants that they mention are the agave plant and the red mulberry that was they used to make silk. The Chinese made, made a lot of silk, and so any plants that they found that were similar to the plants they were used to, like the white mulberry, they, they made note of in their, in their records of their expedition. Okay. Anyway, uh, please like and subscribe to my channel. 
and and please support me by buying the merchandise, the t-shirts, the, the mugs, the treasure hunting mugs and t-shirts, the petroglyph merchandise that I have. And there'll be a link below. Because I'm subsidizing this channel. I'm not making any money. I, I'm, this is, comes out of my own time. I don't make enough money for my ad revenue. I hate putting ads on the channel, but it goes a little ways towards helping me justify putting in my time to, to put this information on YouTube. I'm always going to be doing the research, but I may not always be putting it on YouTube. Uh, as I get busier and busier in life and some things um, happen, I keep looking at the YouTube channel and wondering is it, if it's really worth it. And financially it is not. I don't make anything off this channel. In fact, I I subsidize it quite a bit each month. Um, anyway, if you'll consider purchasing some of my products, then you're getting something for your money. You're not just giving money out. And it helps my channel to be able to justify to my wife, with my time, to be able to continue to do these things. I have so many, so much more evidences of different things. In the next video I want to go more into some petroglyphs and explain how how to read and understand some of the things found in the petroglyphs. And um, anyway, I'm gonna, the, 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 there's a, gonna be a gathering in northern Utah in August, in Altamont, Utah from August 12th to 13th this year. They call it the Moon Lake Gathering. And it's mainly a treasure hunting forum. It's mainly a, a treasure hunting speakers, metal detecting, nugget shooting, Spanish treasure hunters. There are stories about, there's people that with stories about Bigfoot and UFO encounters because of the famous Skinwalker Ranch that is right there in that region, right next door to that area is where Skinwalker Ranch is. And so there's going to be people talking about the ancient history of America, treasure hunting, Bigfoot, UFOs, and very and a lot of other controversial but interesting things that everybody wants to know and learn about. Everybody wants to see the evidences of. Last year they had a couple of individuals that had very, very unique Bigfoot stories of, of sight, sightings that were almost unbelievable, where literally a whole family witnessed a Bigfoot up close and personal, and another guy tells some really cool stories about his experiences. Anyway, um, I'm going to put links to that gathering below as well, um, as well as a, a link to the a YouTube video about the gathering that has been put out by the group in charge. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, please like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video.